ReZero Episode 6 Part 2, corresponding with original Episode 11. Oh, good, Demon Flashback. You and your one horns. Embarrassing. Now there's one horn between the two of them. Right. It's the only way. The most important virtue. Racial pride. We just blast them? You're just gonna blast them with your magic? That's terrible. This is not the most flattering introduction to the Demi Clan. We got racial purity and infanticide in the span of 15 seconds. I'd want to join the humans too. Even with their inferior gate technology. <laughs> Even from babyhood, Rem already saving Ram? From the beginning, she was born this way. That's a lot to overcome. A beast. Oh yeah, give me the backstory. They were prodigies. Right. Also, Ram was the, the prodigy one. Hmm. Wow, it's backwards now. This totally reversed. The way it was introduced at first was it's all about Rem. I think one point I even said that there were two Rems. Sometimes it's interesting to watch shows you've been aware of for a while and like your preconceptions line up with reality. Even knowing very little about the show, the one thing I was aware of was Rem's character because for like for a while I felt like she was all over the internet. I didn't even know that there, <laughs> there was a sister. I don't know if this speaks to any larger reality in the fandom, but based solely on that initial experience, I'm imagining Rem is the more popular one in the fandom. Interesting to see her being displayed as initially in Ram's shadow. Ram may be looking out for Ram. Maybe that was the first debt. It's, it's there. That hurts even more. She's trying to make it better and she did make it better, but she also made it so much worse. Oh, <laughs> that's cute. Ah, uh, that's why she's so good at housework. She's trying to find value for herself. That's heartbreaking. This is, I feel, actually is a very real thing I've seen with siblings. It's a very treacherous situation. If one kid in the family is the one that contains all the hopes of the authority figures, that is very threatening on an existential level for kids whose entire survival in terms of biological programming is hinged on being accepted. One thing I feel I've seen is younger siblings, I don't know how deliberate it is, but they end up finding a lane that distinguishes them with varying degrees of success and also emotional health in that. Sometimes what that looks like is acting out. This is sensitive, but I think one example of this that is maybe most intuitively obvious is if you have two siblings, one of whom is highly physically attractive and the other is not. That's tough because like, well, we're born in the same family. We have, you know, 50% of the same DNA, but my sibling is just higher on a podium naturally than me. That's a rough one. You imagine that can branch off into two opposite paths with maybe a spectrum in between. On the one end, just total resentment and hatred, jealousy. The other is just that giving way to love and appreciation of what is really important, which is your sibling. And then finding your identity and your place in the world, which is everyone's challenge anyway. And even though this has the danger of being used as sort of a sour grapes approach to the problem, I really do think that every position contains its own unique advantage. I don't know about Ram and Ram, but just taking a hypothetical example, the golden child also has a burden. There's a lot more pressure to match a very specific image that they have for you. The younger child has a little bit more freedom to explore what they want, which also of course is a challenge, but then a different opportunity. Speaking of older and younger siblings, one benefit the younger sibling might have, and I've seen this echoed across most of my friends with siblings, the older child grows up largely influenced by the parents and other relatives in the family, grandparents, what have you. The younger sibling has all of that same stuff, plus the advantage of socializing with the older sibling. So I feel like a lot of times younger siblings end up much more gregarious socially. About the golden child thing, one potential outcome of that, the golden child that had all the expectation crumbles under the pressure. Whereas the younger child, having sort of already given up on the expectation, Expectations and having to find their own path earlier is like more free and ends up having a little bit more life satisfaction, having found their own meaning for life. But then also ironically ends up getting closer to matching the initial 
expectations placed on the golden child. There are just so many ways it can go. It's so complicated and somewhat counterintuitive and will really come down to the individual and their choices. Going back to the really difficult example of one sibling being better looking than the other, that also contains its curse because there is perhaps less challenge and self-discovery to being extremely good looking. Getting everything you want, having people laugh at everything you say, treat you like you're amazing just on the virtue of your good looks, which you did nothing to earn, often ends up coming around and eating itself if nothing else of value has been developed. Whereas the less attractive sibling has had to develop that value from the beginning. Oh, it just hit me that it's extra crazy that Rem wanted to join the humans. If I'm reading the folktale correctly, Rem wanted to sacrifice her demonhood and her ability and power. The thing that Rem maybe always coveted about Ram. Like, she's so great. She's so amazing. I'm working so hard to match her and she doesn't even want it. Everyone loves Team Tato's. Let me do my thing. Let me carve my own path. Uh oh. I hope this doesn't lead to Ram saving her, even when she's trying to cook dinner. Oh no, my Totoro nuts. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here it is. Can't even cook dinner right. Humiliating. Well, probably totally an invention of her own mind. You gotta be more careful, Rem. Yeah, don't stress your sister out. She's got important golden child work to do. Yeah, they're okay, I guess. <laughs> Stop helping me, Ram. Damn it! Stop being so nice! I hate you. It's weird and confusing, but I hate you for how great you are. I just wanted to do something on my own, damn it. I wanted to make my own steamed potatoes without getting hit by a fiery tree. This is a dream. Why does it feel like a dream? Yeah, this is how she feels. This is her concern. Damn you. Damn you for being so great. I love you and I hate you. <laughs> Heartbreaking. I'm glad though. I'm I'm really glad that that's the conclusion and takeaway. Even if it's conflicting and confusing. That she doesn't let that corrupt her heart for her sister who's really great to her. Also, it's not Ram's fault she's gifted. I mean, really, it's on the parents and this village. Their weird value system. And as a kid, you can't separate what's what. Like, the adult value system is the objective value system. You live and die by it. You just gotta survive long enough to figure out that there's so much more. In fact, that exact thing might be what I was speaking to about the advantage of the situation. You just can't see it yet. This also is not correct in a certain way. I'm pretty sure that from Ram's perspective, Ram is her equal because she's prioritizing different things. Yeah, Ram as a kid is like probably really happy for the praise from her family, but her gifts, her power, her ability doesn't mean to her what it means to her parents. Her sister means a lot to her. I mean, the way I relate to this the most is I had a somewhat unusual experience with this as a kid because in some very small, limited way, but sufficient enough for it to have an impact in my life, I was in a very coveted position working with actors that my parents and their parents idolized. So that conferred upon me a lot of attention and praise. But I was five or six years old when I started. I didn't know any of the, the people I was working with. I didn't even know what the movie industry was. I hadn't grown up watching these people. I hadn't grown up watching movies. I was watching Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. You don't even know that it's rare. You don't have any data to draw on yet. It was just something that I was doing. So the attention, of course, it's nice as a kid, but there's still something about it that's really empty and it's not what you're looking at. It's not your framework for life and what's important. The extent to which it would interfere with things, like I think it maybe did create some weirdness with people in my family. Either some resentment of the attention I was getting, or an otherness, like suddenly being an object on a pedestal that is frustrating because it's not what I want. It's not what mattered. I mean, I don't even know how accurate any of what I'm saying is because I, again, I was really young and I'm trying to look back on it with my adult conception and my memory is surely faulty, but that's the takeaway that I had coming out of it. So I don't know for sure, but I mean, I imagine that's probably similar to what's happening with Ram. Ram's value structure is not like who can move water more, etc. What are you doing? You are burning the whole village? You are killing the whole town. Oh, oh, this, wow, okay. Oh, I know what happened. They were gonna kill, they were gonna kill Rem? That is 
such a crazy choice at that age. She lost her horn saving ram. And she's a little bit relieved. Oof, and she deals with this. She goes from being the golden child to being second after being on top. Like, I really don't think that was her value structure, but like still, you know, you're human. Those things are there. Or if it's not how Ram is feeling, like that would be a very natural response. And you only are in this position because you sacrificed the thing that once gave you that attention and, and put you on the map, made you special, for the person who's now getting the attention instead of you. There's just a lot of like very dangerous incentives there. <laughs> Speaking of debt. She hates herself for having that thought. Yikes. Okay, that clears it up. Also, I think I fell into the obvious trap of assuming the blue ogre was the girl with blue hair. And the story, it's the red ogre who suffers under the burden of feeling like they've incurred debt to the blue ogre. But that person in this scenario is Rem, no? It was Rem that sacrificed what Rem perceives to be her most cherished gifts for her sake, in a way that she never asked for, though there's a lot of guilt there because Terrible, like you wish for someone else's demise because it would make you feel better and then you're like well hopefully you're like what am i doing how did i get here my personal opinion is that it's 100 percent fine to have dark thoughts <laughs> like have at it don't beat yourself up for having like natural gut human emotions the important thing is then what you do with them this is a very non-serious way to think about it but just an example i feel this way about my cat man my ex-girlfriend got the cat and then broke up and she dumped them on me and god does it make my life difficult especially with my insanely trans transitory life situation thoughts pop up like he'd survive on his own <laughs> there are other cats in the neighborhood they're alive but obviously i love him. i'm not going to abandon him i don't beat myself up too much for witnessing those thoughts arise that just doesn't do anything. At any rate, the net result of the sacrifice is the red ogre, Ram, losing the blue ogre, Ram, which is interesting because it suggests that because of Ram's sacrifice, Ram has lost her sister or lost the thing that she cherished. Not 100% sure what to make of that, but there's a couple things. One is that the debt creates the burden that ruins the play, even if it's totally self-inflicted. It also, in a certain way of looking at it, firmly cements Ram as the better one, maybe confirming Ram's fears, even if it wasn't about the powers. I mean, it's a bit confusing because of the hair colors and they both contain elements of each and they've also switched places. But if this interpretation is correct, then by her own admission, Ram also bears some resentment for Ram, while also thinking that she herself is self-indulgent in thinking about her own sacrifice. When Ram hears the story from Subaru, she says it's the Red Ogre, who I'm interpreting to be Rem, as having lost nothing, which of course is not true from Rem's perspective, she's lost her sister, which is the thing she valued most of all. I mean, which is what both of them probably valued most of all. That's the tragedy of the story, that somehow despite all of the love they have for each other, they lose each other. The good news is they haven't actually lost anything. They still have each other. This just all needs to get cleared out. There's just so much to this. I mean, it's also really frustrating for Ram, who can no longer protect her sister. She's the one who sacrifices. She is the caretaker, but then because of that choice, she is forced to be the one cared for. It also, maybe most importantly, gives added significance to Subaru's choice because Subaru actually is the one who can see what's important. He's cutting through it and seeing the goodness in each of them. It's not a comparison. It's not who did more for whom. Speaking of relationship traps, that's a big one. Like, you know you've gone wrong in a relationship when you're doing tit for tat, who did what? Who did worse things to whom? You're accusing me of this, but how can you say that when you did that? Or how can you accuse me of this after all the good I've done for you in that? Once the relationship has gone into the realm of goodness calculus, you've lost the path. It's not about accumulating points. You've gone away from the natural rest reciprocity that makes relationships beautiful. You've turned it from the beauty of something greater than the sum of its parts to a zero-sum game. Wait, who was that? <laughs> I missed that the first time. Right, okay, it's complicated. Now Rem is the blue ogre. Now she's gone because she's sacrificing too much as penance to atone. The path she gave you is another way to look at that. It was never true. This is still childhood talking. <laughs> Doing too much. 
That explains the desire, the self-sacrifice. You don't need to punish yourself for getting a gift. You don't need to say sorry. You just need to say thank you. Snap out of it. This is indulgent. Nobody wants this. Set him straight to borrow. Blast through it with your goodness. We actually slapped her? <laughs> we headbutted her. Oh, he busted his head open on Rem's head. Alright, the point is there. The gift you think you're giving us is not a gift, but you could very well give us the gift that we all want, which is you and your happiness. I mean, I think this whole self-sacrifice thing at its root is something really beautiful, but like staggeringly painful that we're hiding from most of the time. Or It's hard to keep this conception in its full capacity constantly because of how suffocating it is and its greatness. But like even without a specific situation where there's a clear and obvious sacrifice, the world that you're living in, the things that you have, is a tremendous gift from tremendous amounts of people that you did nothing originally to deserve. You were just born into it that you can never repay. If you think about how many people have fought and struggled and died and worked hard to create positive inputs into the world and didn't let their base instincts take over and were on net good people despite all the incentives to the contrary. All of your direct ancestors who lived full difficult lives that carried the torch of your lineage and also people with whom you shared no genetic relation that did the same with their offspring that created the world that you live in. For you, a baby who had yet to contribute anything and all the people who suffered and died and didn't make it, whose example we've learned from, whose stories we tell, who have nothing close to the opportunities that you have. Yeah, that's suffocating. And like the easiest thing to do there is to hate yourself and to just wallow in the guilt of it. But if you really think about it, is that what they were fighting for? All of the sacrifices, all of this work, all of this pain, all of this hope for the future, for you to spend your life hating yourself and throwing your life away, it's not deliberately contemptful of that gift, but it runs counter to the intention of the gift. The way I think you cope with this pain is that you do your best to acknowledge it, maybe only in fleeting moments. And then you pick up the torch and carry that legacy forward for future generations, which means living at your best and probably includes your happiness or just general well-being. To reduce this into a single relationship, like imagine your parents love you and out of their love for you with no expectations, they do everything. They sacrifice large aspects of their lives towards your development with every hope for your future well-being. And then your response is to live your life in misery because of the gifts you've been given. Which would be better? To spend your life living in misery over the beautiful things you've been given? To hate yourself for having received something beautiful that other people willingly gave you? Or to be grateful to say thank you rather than sorry and like live well? I mean, wouldn't that be like the best form of success and the best way to honor the people who gave you so much? And we're still not out of this. But now we're together as three. And three heads are better than one. Oh, yeah, she would never survive another sacrifice for her. Sparrow's not doing calculus. He's not scoring points. She has no idea what you're talking about. They're not leaving. They're turning around. Man, finally, I knew it was gonna happen eventually. No, you don't. <laughs> blind, can you do blind yet? And dead. It would be so awesome if Subaru just soloed this dog right now. He won't, but it would be really cool. Oh, he put. Yeah, there it is. Nice. And his blind became an area attack. Is he actually soloing this thing? I was sleeping on Subaru. Please don't return by death now, we've come so far. We, For the love of God, save. You do need to die, for real. You've been a problem since the beginning. Oh, it's Roswell flying in. And napalming the entire forest. Oh! <laughs> it's a dangerous nickname. Now that bath time inappropriateness really paid off. Oh, 
Oh, he was following. He was observing. You you're sort of late. <laughs> it took you long enough to come down. I also think Roswell kind of saw through it, or his take on it was that they're both doing fine because they have each other. Either totally underestimating the situation, or seeing above it, having a bird's eye view on it, seeing where their hearts really are and how it'll probably resolve itself. Also funny, speaking of Roswell's bath time fun, in that conversation, Subaru called Ram useless and inferior to Ram, and that people only praise her because she's the older sister. He also bought it. Personally, I don't think I want to see Roswell's gratitude. I don't want your gratitude. <laughs> yeah, that was big. There was no rescuing. Checkpoint. Yeah, we... Thank God. We've saved. <laughs> That's a familiar ceiling. And we are building a harem. What is Amelia gonna think? Mamiya well, doesn't care. <laughs> she doesn't care at all. At this point, at least. I would have liked to have seen that, but okay. Well, I guess we saw the most of it. He made it look very easy. You don't need to say sorry, you need to say thank you. When will you learn, fool? Subaru didn't do it for apologies. Or for thanks. Well, here's the breakdown I was talking about. It'd be cool if Ram was here too. But they're still not seeing that they have a gift greater than their horns. <laughs> right, that's the reality. Yeah, I mean, it's her own guilt that she's trapped in. Kind, you say. Oh, I didn't notice that. How did he manage to sexualize this moment? Of all the things he could have said. Right, it's not both of them. Oh, he doesn't know what we know. <laughs> oh, Subaru is me. I see you, Subaru. A lot of this is, is just carrying the baggage of parents that were not great. I mean, maybe that's unfair. Maybe they were good parents before they consented to have one of their daughters murdered. But more accurately, it's Rem's interpretation of her parents' value system that she internalized in like a very simplified, childish way. But it's like time to shed that now. Sometimes the biggest obstacle is just not knowing you have that option, not realizing it's a very specific value structure that you've inherited. Like, who cares about your magical power? It's great, you know, but like I said before, there's an advantage to every position. If you're born five feet tall with one foot, but you're told from birth that the only people that matter in this world are basketball players, yeah, obviously you're going to be miserable, but that's not the extent of what life is. Enjoy the gifts you've been giving, is what I'm taking that to mean. It always kind of bothers me when he tells them to smile, because of the stereotype that conjures up. Maybe you can make rabbit with nuts, everyone's favorite. It's time to start defining your own value and working towards it. He's looking a lot more confident now, though. And he's very clear and straightforward on his beliefs, which gives a feeling of strength. Now we both know what that means. <laughs> Finally. I'm half expecting, like, an angry witch hand to come and chop his head off right now, because <laughs> this is not the plan. Ram. Well, Ram totally shafted. <laughs> Ram just unappreciated for her sacrifice. I don't know, it's a bit confusing trying to make an exact parallel with the red and blue ogre thing. They both have elements of each, and they seem to switch roles. I mean, maybe, maybe you could look at it as, like, the red ogre trying to pay off its debt to the blue ogre, and then, like, becoming the blue ogre. Hopefully there's a happy ending to this story where both the red and blue ogre get to give to each other and don't lose each other. Okay. Oh, it was one of those little bastards. Have we ever seen Ram with 
Roswell? Is it always... Wait, is it always Ram on his lap? That is potentially a weird, dark reading of this. Maybe this is the way Ram is protecting Ram. I don't know, am I, am I being too jaded right now? Okay. <laughs> sure, that's interesting. You know what else is really nerve-wracking? Putting myself in Subaru's shoes? He doesn't have any way of knowing if a checkpoint's been activated, right? He needs to die to confirm it. I would be so paranoid, man, with the prospect of undoing all that. Suddenly a, a worry pops into mind that Subaru, my expectations were Subaru gets more confident and so these outbursts end. Now I'm thinking it's possible he gets more confident so these outbursts get worse. Speaking of debt. But she's got it. No sorry, no burden. We know. Hey, follow your own advice. There's no debt here. Don't give this man power. You can watch the kids stuff my pockets with worms. And dirt. She's not getting it, just know what she's signing up for. You don't need to explain. <laughs> Didn't ask, but alright, now we know. Okay, he's earned it. Wow, that was an insanely packed episode. So much in there. I'm sort of stuck on the Ram Roswell thing. Maybe she's still sacrificing. Maybe she's still in the role of keeping her sister safe. Maybe still being sacrificial to her own detriment. Though surely I'm misreading this because Roswell is such an upstanding guy. I mean, honestly, part of me is reserving judgment because I don't know the structure of the world. I don't know what's at stake. I'm not willing to fully commit to who has the noble cause and who doesn't. I mean, despite the term witch and the reverence people have for the dragon. I don't really know. We will just have to wait and see.